we're going to transfer that design now onto our cast. I like to begin by placing my rest first. The Kennedy Class 3 requires a rest next to each edentulous area. So first of all, in this anterior edentulous area, I would have a rest on each of these canines, and it's going to be a cingulum rest because the cingulum rest is more aesthetic on a maxillary canine and the enamel is very nice and thick back there in that area so we can afford to have a natural cingulum that can be reduced to have a rest. The rest is usually placed at or above the junction of the middle and cervical third and that rest prep will have a position where this uh, part of the rest is deeper than right here at the little natural cingulum. Um, a lot of these rest preps on this cast have already been cut and that way I won't have to do quite as much time cutting the preps but you will have to possibly stop the recording in order to prepare your rest seats. So when we prepare this rest seat we're going to below the point of occlusion whatever that is. You might want to mark the occlusion um, with some articulating ribbon and then below that we're going to prepare our rest no higher than the junction of the middle third and cervical third if possible we'd like to have about a one millimeter to one millimeter and a half ledge so to speak on this tooth and the point inside here is down or a positive seat compared to right out here at the uh, uh, natural cingulum border. So we want something that's going to sit on that and not slip off. The other thing that we do not want, we do not want any undercuts in this area. That rest has to go right into place and not go into an undercut. So it's a nice rounded chevron and I'm going to go ahead and redraw my rest right here. On the other side, again, I would prepare that rest so I'm going to redraw those particular rests. Now, I'm going to, while I'm at it, look at these guiding planes because you can see that we have a very high survey line right along here. Now, the guide plate is drawn. We're coming up here. Uh, I'm going to use my ground. We're going to come up. We're going to have our metal across this area here, millimeter or so above my cingulum rest and it will come down right about here you see your natural cusp tip and that cingulum or that guide plate will come down right about here we don't take the guide plate all the way out here for a couple of reasons we want to butt a denture tooth up against this tooth and if we bring the metal all the way out to here we will butt the tooth up against metal so we'll see a silver sliver right in this area so we want to keep it back so that we can butt our tooth up against here. We also don't want to prep the tooth all the way out and eliminate the width of this canine right here because then we would have to set a tooth that is larger than what was in there originally in this space and the patient will not be happier with bigger teeth than what they had before. So we have a real high guide plate on this area so we're going to prepare our guide plate to attempt to lower that survey line so that we have at least a two millimeter zone where the metal guides into position and can be all above our survey line. It can't be below the survey line because it can't get into an undercut. So we're preparing that guide plate. We'll check to make sure that that guide plate that we did in fact lower our survey line which we did as you can see by this new line and we'll redraw any brown that's missing which we haven't uh, had any problem there and we will re-identify an area on our tooth that is going to have to be adjusted when we get to rest preps on our natural teeth so we'll make a circle in this area and a couple of straight marks through there and that will tell us that we have a rest prep and some guiding planes to work, worry about over there. I'm going to go ahead and do the other side since it's similar. We're going to have our plating. It's going to come right along in here. It's going to be above, above our rest 
prep and that guide plate will come down right about in this area here not quite out we're looking at the cusp tip and then our guide plate comes down right about there we also have a very high survey line right in this particular area here we're going to have excuse me two rests in here this is a an embrasure rest we're going to have a rest on each one of these premolars and remember that we've got arms coming we got an arm coming through here that's going to engage the mesiofacial 0.01 undercut on this tooth and we have to have a bit of a sluice way coming through this lingual area in order for metal to come up and over the hump of that cusp area without being in occlusion with the opposing arch so we're going to prepare a rest seat and a rest seat is spoon shaped we usually reduce the marginal ridge approximately one to one and a half millimeters and then we reduce the fossa a little bit more uh, as needed to make a positive rest seat down in that fossa now we don't want any sharp walls along here we don't want it to look like an MO prep we want it to be more spoon shaped so I'm going to get rid of some of these real sharp walls and same way on this other side I want my my central fossa to be deeper than my marginal ridge and I don't I don't want any sharp preparation walls in this area and I'm going to prepare a sluice way through here so I usually will take a round burr and come right through that area with my round burr and I like to take a little bit off of both teeth so that I don't have one tooth that looks like it's um, deformed because so much is missing for the metal to come through that area so and I need to get up into that fossa without affecting occlusion so I have to remove some cusp in this area in order to prepare my sluice ways usually when you look at this from the front you almost see a little bit of a notch that's been taken out of that tooth where the metal arm will come through and have enough bulk that it will not break off now let's fill it back in with red to indicate we're going to have to adjust our rest preps on the teeth when we get to our patient this guide or this um, plating here has to hook up with that first rest and when I come around like this I want to keep my plating no higher than the middle third keeping in mind that this is a cusp that's in occlusion with the opposing mandibular teeth it's going down into the boss of the mandibular molars or premolars so I'm going to draw my rest around here my rest is around the one I just prepared and it's going to go through that area there we're also here's the metal coming up from the lingual and I'm preparing circling around that rest and that those two arms those two marks this one will become the superior border of my direct retainer so I'm going to come down with my direct retainer and I'm going to engage my 0.01 undercut and come back up to this rest right here now we like this direct retainer arm to be a smiley face we don't want it to plunge down like it's an airplane that's crashing into the ocean I have taken my direct retainer arm more than the terminal third here's about a third of it right from here on out I need to lower my survey line here's my survey line here so I need to lower that survey line from there down to just below my direct retainer arm so I'm going to have to get out my diamond burrs and I'm going to prepare that tooth with my diamond burrs and I'm going to lower that survey line down to 
below only in the first two thirds. I want that uh, terminal third to be into the 0.01 undercut. I'm going to bring that arm down now. Oh, I better check to see if I have in fact lowered my survey line there. When I run this along with my surveyor, I have in fact lowered my survey line down to this position. So now I can draw my direct retainer arm entirely above the new survey line in that original third, two thirds rather. Okay, so that's my new position of my survey line. I've got to remind myself by placing the circle here that I'm going to have to come back here and adjust my tooth when I get to the tooth preparation stage. Going to continue, here's our rest outlined. It comes back to this point. We need to come down, stay in the middle third of our tooth, go up, close that embrasure space, come back along the middle third of the tooth. We'd like to stay one or two millimeters above our survey line in the middle third of the tooth. Come up here and we're going to have a rest in that area. So we'll draw our rest and we know we have to prepare our rest with some sluice waves, which is what we're going to do at this time. So again, about a millimeter to a millimeter and a half at the marginal ridge. The bossa of the rest will be a millimeter, approximately a millimeter deep, and it's going to be deeper than the marginal ridge. We want it deeper than the marginal ridge. We want it to be spoon shaped. We don't want MO preps, amalgam preps. We just want it spoon shaped. We don't want to go through into the dentin. If you go through the dent into the dentin, it's very uncomfortable for the patient. Now, we have to have a couple of sluice ways in this area. And again, I usually will come through with a round diamond and I'll bring it right through that embrasure area, taking a little bit off of both teeth so that I don't have one that looks kind of lopsided. But I'm trying to make room for metal to come through here with an arm without disrupting the occlusion. And if I don't take enough off here, then what ends up happening is you have to adjust the occlusion and you may end up having an arm that breaks off along the way. So I've got to have metal coming up over that hump there that's in occlusion. And I have to make room for that with a sluice way. All right, let's see what we see from the front. Do we see a little bit of a notch? We do, where our metal for our arm can come through without affecting occlusion. So we're going to redraw our rest. Redraw our rest in red as a reminder that we need to adjust those in the mouth when we get to that point with the construction of our partial and from this side we're seeing that our plating comes along here it goes up at this point and circles that rest here's our framework coming up over that that will become the bottom line of our direct retainer we're going to bring this line along this rest here that will become the top line of our direct retainer so our direct retainer will come down here we'd like to keep it above the survey line in the first two-thirds and I don't think we have a problem doing that without even having to adjust this tooth so we're going to come down we're going to come back we're going to engage that 01 undercut we're going to stay above our su survey line right here and go back up and that becomes that part of the rest right up there. So we don't have any adjustment of the tooth to have to do in that area. Alright, we're then going to come, we have our rest, we'll come down. We're going to plate, we have to have a reciprocal component. Every clasp assembly must have a rest, a direct retainer, and a reciprocal component. This reciprocal component 
keeps that tooth from moving when that rest, that direct retainer flexes over the undercut. The tooth can't move to the lingual when it flexes over that undercut uh, because this is reciprocating or bracing the tooth. So we come down here and we're going to come straight across with our major connector. That major connector is going to go on across the arch, come on back up, and it will become the reciprocal component on this tooth, again drawn in the middle third. We don't want it to get into occlusion. So this one's going to come in this direction. Now, we are, have some rest over here, but we also have some very high survey lines that are on our guide plate areas. So when we have this type of situation, we're going to have a rest in here. And we're going to have a rest in here. But before we cut our rest, before we cut our rest, we have a very high survey line on the mesial marginal ridge here. And we need to lower that survey line. We want to lower our guide plate first because it's hard to say how much we have to take away. But if we take too much away, if we've already prepared our rest, we're going into the rest and kind of running the tooth in that area. So the first thing that we want to do is to cut our guide plate and get it right. Then we'll prepare our rest. So we're coming along here. We're going to alter this tooth and we're going to try and lower our survey line. And I'm going to smooth this area out right here too because our arm's going to come here and we want that arm to be all above survey line at that point, so I'm going to lower it a little bit right through there too. Well, I don't want to get into denting. That's one reason we used our survey. And I'm going to enhance it again with my surveyor. Oops, it helps to use the lead side, doesn't it? Okay, so I have lowered my survey line there. Now I'm going to prepare my rest seat because I've already taken some of this off. What if that was the depth of my fossa right there uh, that interfered with, with that guide plate? Then I would have to even take it down farther in, or in the fossa area to get a good positive seat. So now I'm ready to prepare my rest prep. And I'm going to go into the tooth a little bit more. I'm going to go into the tooth a little bit more because I have removed some of my tooth right there. And I want it to be a positive seat. So I want the point in the fossa to be deeper than my marginal ridge. But I want my marginal ridge to be lowered at least a millimeter to a millimeter and a half to make room for metal in there. And that metal's got to be strong enough that it's not going to break on us under some occlusal forces on that edentulous area. I like to prepare a little bit of a sluice way here where my arm can stay close to the tooth and I tend to remove a little bit of tooth structure right there and I tend to remove a little bit of tooth structure right here to allow for my arm to come through there without creating too much bulk. Okay, there's that one prepared. I'm going to color in my rest. And I'm going to still make the mark, the circle, on my guide plate area, showing that I adjusted my guide plate area. And the plating comes forward. It goes up. It becomes the edge of that rest seat. Then it becomes the arm over here. We draw our direct retainer, keeping my direct retainer, and I can keep it all above survey line right here. I'm lucky here. I don't have to do much adjustment. Sometimes you have to adjust in that area. I'm keeping it above my survey line. I'm going to come back here, engage my .01 undercut, and go back up. Now, when I engage my .01 undercut and I come up here, I'm going to go down and it becomes a guide plate right there. 
right behind my cusp tip. There's a guide plate right there. And on this side, there's really not a guide plate because that's all plating in that area. But I'm showing my adjustments. All right, we move on up to the premolar, and I have the same type of problem here. I have a guide plate. I have a, a rest in there, but before I prepare my rest seat, I want to prepare that guiding plane. I'm trying to lower my survey line so that I have a guide plate and my metal can touch the side of this tooth in a two millimeter range. The way it is right now with the guide with the uh, survey line all the way up at the marginal ridge of the tooth, anything below that has to be blocked out so I don't have any guiding plane. It's not even touching the tooth in that area. So I want it to be touching the tooth in that area over at least a two millimeter zone. So I'm going to take it, reduce it with my diamond, and I'm going to resurvey it and it says that I have in fact lowered my survey line a couple of millimeters. Guide planes are usually between cusp tips, about half the width of the um, from cusp tip to cusp tip. So there, I have a nice guide plate drawn in that area now. And so I'm going to go ahead and prepare my rest seat. Again, what I take off is about a millimeter to a millimeter and a half at the marginal ridge. I want the fossa part to be deeper than my marginal ridge, so in this case I'm going to have to reduce it a little bit more. I want it to be spoon shaped. I don't want any real steep walls anywhere. And I'm going to prepare a little bit of a sluice way for my arm to come through here and my arm, uh, plating to come around right here. So I'll fill my rest back in with red pencil. And I'm going to make that circle to show that I adjusted that guide plate also in that area. Put a couple of cross hatches on it to indicate that I have adjusted that area. And then we're going to have a rest. I'm drawing my metal right around that rest. The top border is going to become my direct retainer. It's going to come down. It's going to go below the survey line, engage my O1 undercut, and hopefully in a smiley face outline form. And it's going to come back up to my guide plate area, and it's going to come down and be a guide plate right in that area. My, my terminal third of my clasp is right about right here. And I may have gone below the survey line just a smidge right in this area. And I'm going to make a slight red circle there to indicate that I adjusted my tooth just a little bit in that area. Um, we had our plating here. We have to come to this embrasure. We're going to plate over to our rest. We have to have a reciprocal component. We want to keep that in the middle third of the tooth. I'm probably right about at the junction of the middle and cervical third. I come around here, it becomes my rest, and that becomes the arm. It comes down and becomes the guide plate. I think we've completed all the lines on the other side. In this anterior area, we talked about some options. We could do facings because we don't have extreme resorption. And we'd want to do facings if we had a really deep vertical bite because those teeth would be backed with metal and that metal would protect the plastic teeth from being broken off. And it would protect it very well with as much metal that would come almost to the incisal edge. The teeth would look like they're budding up against this ridge and that they were growing out. So if the patient has a nice high smile line, it's a very aesthetic to do the facings. There's also something called wraps, which are re reinforced acrylic ponics, and I think we're going to do that in this area. Um, they may tend to be a little more aesthetic because they don't have that metal behind them that sometimes grays out the dental tooth a little bit. 
um, wraps are probably not as good if you have a really deep vertical bite but they're too very aesthetic so the way we draw a facing or a wrap is that we come down at the guide plate area and we come straight across the ridge and we go back up to the guide plate area on the opposing side. Now if we were doing facings we would put four F's out here on our cast. If we're going to do wraps we'll put RAP, 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 one for each tooth. The wrap though has an additional component other than just that straight line. The wrap has a little T that comes out here and we place one for each tooth that we're going to put in here and then on our cast we're going to label it reinforced acrylic ponic and R A P okay so that's telling us what the replacement tooth is in that area all right over on this side we could talk about a couple of methods of replacement. One would be the um, tube tooth. Another logical one would be base attachment. Since we might want to reline this area at some future date, then the uh, base attachment is the most satisfactory to use to be able to reline. The wrap up here, we can reline it because it has acrylic wrapped ar uh, an acrylic tooth wrapped around this little metal post that's in here and because it's acrylic up against the tissues and just this one little bit of metal we could reline that one not easily but it can be relined the facing can't be relined it's all metal behind it and under it and you can't get acrylic to stick to it so if you have resorption of that anterior ridge the facing is going to be unsatisfactory and you're going to probably have to remake that partial denture. To draw our um, base attachment we come down right at the line angle of the tooth and we come back a little bit and we start across paralleling our ridge but we want to leave enough room to set a molar the size of this molar all within the confines of that base attachment. So we come up here, and again, we're a little bit behind our tooth. We want a couple millimeters, ideally, of acrylic holding that denture tooth in place and that denture tooth sitting into that area and be all on base attachment. So here's our external finish line. Um, on the anterior, it's sometimes good to go ahead and uh, show where our acrylic is going to be. So I have my blue pencil, blue means acrylic, and we're coming down here and we're going to have an acrylic flange that comes up and that theoretically should be rounded. It's not, we're not going to have any points there. And we would avoid any frenum attachments if we had them. Alright, back here we have our external finish line and we will have an internal finish line along this area and that is indicated by a dotted line. So somewhere between those two we need to have some loops that will hold our uh, denture teeth in place. So we're going to come straight down here and back up over to this area and within that we're going to put some holes and the acrylic resin will flow through these holes and help hold these denture teeth into position. So again, you want this to be sufficient that it will hold the denture teeth into position. We don't want the denture teeth sitting on our major connector, which would be this uh, external finish line. So that's what our base attachment would look like with the base incorporated. Now, one last thing left to do on this, we have to think about our major connector. And our eight major connector needs to be a minimum of 8 millimeters in width. So we're going to place um, at about the 8 millimeter mark. I'm going to put a little mark on my cast. All right, I want that to be 8 millimeters wide. And I'd like it to be 8 millimeters in the front minimum 
but I don't want my border way up here in the zone where the patient would uh, make his S sounds. So I tend to go down with my metal, down that slope a little bit, and I try to position my major connector between the rugae so that if I have metal coming back here, here's a little prominent rugae. If I end my metal right in front of the prominent rugae, then this would be kind of confluent with the metal. It's not going to be a hump there. It's, it's not going to be a, a hump in that area. So I want this area back here to be 8 to 10 millimeters. You don't have to note this on a test. I'm just telling you, and I'd like that one to be 8 to 10 millimeters. But I could either come here or I could come back a little farther with my hole and I, um, through this area right here. And I think I like this area a little bit better because it doesn't disrupt the speech zone as well with a um, border of metal. So I said it's a minimum of 8 to 10 millimeters. So I'm trying to point out that that can be more than 10 millimeters. It's a minimum of 8 to 10. Then I would like to have my sides to be a minimum of nine, 7 to 9. So I'm going to come on down here about this position. And I'd like this to be a minimum of 7 to 9. And, but I want it to be kind of symmetrical with the other side. So I think if I look at these four parameters here, I'm going to draw a hole in my palette. And I want that hole to be at least the minimum size of a nickel, or I don't even want to put it, OK? And I want it to be rounded. Now, sometimes those borders will be real kind of funky because of uh, going between rugae. They don't have to be perfectly symmetrical with a round circle but uh, you want to open and expose as much of the palette as you can. So again, I'm going to put a little 7 to 9 as a reminder here for you when you look or study this. I'm going to make some notes to myself on the cast because I adjusted the tooth here, so I'm going to put lower survey line, okay, to indicate that I need to lower my survey line right there. I didn't have to adjust this one at all. I did have to do rest preps, but those are pretty obvious. When I came along here, um, I didn't redraw my red right in here to show that I had lowered the guide plate. So I'm going to put a circle right here and a couple of little cross hatches. And I'm going to put out here lower survey line guide plate, GP. Over here, I lowered my survey line on the guide plate, LSL, GP, guide plate. Right here, lowered my survey line right in the middle, okay? And then both areas, um, lower survey line, GP, guide plate and lower survey line guide plate. Did I do anything on the lingual? Other than all my red rest preps, I don't think I lowered any survey lines on my lingual. So I have all kinds of good notes for myself. And what I want to make sure that I do is that I bring this diagnostic cast with me when I start to do the final design after I've done all my restorative and all my endo and all my crowns. And by the way, if I have to crown this tooth later on, I know that I'm going to ask in my prescription that I want a survey crown with a 0.01 mesial facial undercut prepared into that crown in the mesial third, and that I want a distal occlusal rest uh, prepared in that crown when I send it off. That's called a survey crown and cost you more money when you're getting a survey crown, but that crown should come back, and before you cement it, you should look at that crown and make sure that your lines, um, your survey lines, when you put that cast on there with the crown, all agree with what you had, because again, 
when you send off a crown, you're going to survey that cast so that the laboratory guy will know what position you want that cast at the point where he makes that survey crown. So all of those things have to be factored into it. If you have any questions, uh, be sure to bring your cast that you're working with and bring it to the um, one of the OHR faculty and have them review it and talk to them about it. And if you have any questions, ask those questions about it. This happens to be our Deniform cast, so as many um, impressions as you may have taken during that exercise of diagnostic cast, you may have this cast around. And Just to refresh you with some of the rules for the Kennedy Class 3, we're going to have um, a rest next to each of our edentulous areas and we're going to have a clasp assembly for the Kennedy Class 3 usually on the teeth next to this edentulous area back here. We like to separate our retention so therefore we would like to grab the mesial facial on this area and the distal facial on this side of that edentulous area. We only have two clasps per side on the Kennedy Class 3 and our clasp of choice is the cast circumferential clasp. If we have a, an arm coming between th two teeth, we have to have two rests, a mesial and a distal called an embrasure rest. And the purpose is to alleviate the feeling of wedging because if we placed a rest just on the distal of this tooth and the patient bit down on this tooth on something hard, and we didn't have a rest here, this tooth would want to depress and that arm would go down and the patient would feel a wedging effect like a toothpick being jammed between their teeth in this area. When you have an embrasure rest, both te teeth seat into the um, periodontal ligament a little farther and it eliminates the wedging feeling. Our, usually our major connector in a Kennedy Class III is the anterior posterior palatal strap major connector. I think I said our cast circumferential is the clasp of choice, even though that doesn't mean we couldn't use something like an eye bar up here if we were trying to get better aesthetics. Thank you.